Thank you, Ms. Hannah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I am Minish, and this is my colleague, Daniela. Uh, and we work uh, as game analysts for Miniclip. Today, we're going to talk to you about how we help the game teams to leverage the player life cycle with some specific examples that I will tell you in a minute. But first, I just want to introduce our team. So we are part of the business intelligence team at Miniclip. Uh, here we, all, we are all uh, waiting for our dinner in a really nice Portuguese restaurant <laughs> after our team meeting event this year. And we are a team of 20 people. Uh, we are divided in five teams. So the data engineering team is responsible for all the infrastructure of receiving the data from our games, processing it, and saving in the database. And they are the ones who provide the data that all other members of BI use in their daily work. Then we have the business analytics team, which is concerned with um, data from Miniclip as a company. So they analyze data as a whole, and they compare how Miniclip performance is doing against the competition. Uh, and they mainly uh, report to the finance team. Then there is the game analytics team, which is our team. We analyze player behavior, so we are divided by our different games. We uh, work closely with the production team, the design team, and with the game developers. And we help to um, balance the design of new features that are coming out, and also to uh, check the impact that those features have on the game once they are released. And we also conduct A-B testing. So when we want to test for hypotheses on how, uh, what, what, which are our players' behavior or um, their preferences, we test in live with A-B testing. Then we have the marketing analytics team. Um, they support marketing initiatives in the games, like promotions or marketing campaigns, and they also um, analyze the impact that those have on our games. And the data science team. So data science builds really cool models that I run in production. These models are uh, predictive or prescri prescriptive models, and they analyze things like segmenting users in real time or predicting if a user is going to do a specific action within the game or not. And these models that they build allows Miniclip to give our users a personalized experience within the games. So um, our talk is based on the player life cycle of a freemium game um, because Miniclip builds freemium games and we treat our games as services. So we want our games to uh, run for several years and we want our users to keep playing in this loop and we want to avoid churn. So when a user is acquired to one of our games, our main focus is to retain the user. So we want, it, well, we want him to come back uh, tomorrow or another day soon. And I will talk to you about an example on how our team could help the game uh, to retain different types of users in a specific game. Then, when a user comes back to the game, we want the user to be really engaged, so we want it to do um, meaningful uh, actions within the game. Uh, related to engagement, uh, I will also tell you about an example on how we were able to see the value of different segments of users based on their um, gameplay preferences. And then, uh, being a freemium games company, obviously it's very important for us to monetize our users. Um, and related to monetization, uh, Daniela will tell you on how we managed to uh, have a model that monetizes almost every user within a game, even the ones who don't want to spend money and do uh, in-app purchases in the game. And in order to have our games run for several years, we need them to be viral. So related to virality, Daniela will also tell you about an example on how she helps to uh, balance the development of a new feature uh, in a way that it is truly engaging, but at the same time, the rewards that we give did not unbalance the game economy. So these are four examples we bring you today, and I hope that you're excited to, to hear about them. So starting with retention, I will tell you about soccer which uh, is a multiplayer soccer game. Um, 
And in this, uh, in mini clip games, we always try to promote uh, social network logins. So we want our guest users to do a login with a social platform because we know that's valuable to their retention and their engagement because they would have their friends playing with them um, and it's always a good reason to keep playing. So in order to promote those guest users to upgrade their accounts, we give them this really cool stuff in the game. So if they log in with a social network, they will receive an immediate reward, which is an amount of the hard currency of the game. They will be able to collect free hourly coins, um, and they would be able to play against their friends, invite new friends to the game, um, and also change free coins within their friends. Uh, but the reality is that a lot of our users in Soccer Stars are just not interested in receiving all that. They don't want to do the social login. So here I show you that's our daily basis of users. We have more than 40% of guest users every day. And if we look at the second plot, where uh, I'm showing you the percentage of guest users by their retention day, we can also see that after playing for two months, there are still 50% of guest users. So these guest users, they, they are retained and they are engaged and they like the game. They just don't want to do the social login. So what we thought is that it is time that we would accept these users as guests and start giving them some of the perks that we would give the other users. And that's why we had the hypothesis. What if we give to the guest users the free hourly coins to collect? Because before this A-B test, um, guest users could see the free coins button. If they clicked on it, they got a pop-up saying, well, you have to log in with a social network if you want to receive these coins. So we A-B tested. We had two groups, the control group where guest users did not have the coins available, in, and the test group where they could collect those free coins. And these are the results that we found. Here I'm showing you the retention rates. Uh, the blue line is the test group where everyone, even guests, could collect the free coins. And we saw a significant increase in all retention days that we tested. This is day one. Um, Sorry, day uh, two, day seven, and day 14. So these are really good results because for us, retention is, is really hard to, to improve. Uh, so this was a huge success. We also saw that um, giving the free coins to guest users made them uh, upgrade their guest accounts uh, less than the control group. But we were not concerned with that because we would just accept guest users as they are. As long as they have a better retention, we are really happy with it. So another example on the same, um, another example with the same game uh, that we recently worked on, it's another possibility that guest users didn't have. The possibility to invite their friends to the game. Um, during the Football World Cup this year, we ran this competition within Soccer Stars. It's, it's the World Arena competition, and this is a mock-up of the menu. Uh, while this competition was running, inside this menu, we introduced the WhatsApp, um, WhatsApp button. So with WhatsApp invites, everyone can invite their friends, even guests. And we saw that this button had a lot of engagement, so a lot of people were using WhatsApp to invite, even more than uh, normal Facebook invites. Um, and what we saw from this is that the friends who joined the game through the WhatsApp invitation had really high retention rates in comparison to the organic installs that we had during the same period. So here I'm showing you um, the increase uh, over and above the organic installs for users who logged into the game through WhatsApp. So this increase starts by 50% on day one and goes up to 150% on day 14. Uh, and we're really excited with these results. Uh, and now we plan to, do, to have the WhatsApp invitation in the main menu in the game so that all guest users can invite their friends whenever they want. So moving on to engagement, I will talk to you about an example of two 3D games that we have. 
Uh, the first one that we released was Basketball Stars. It is a basketball multiplayer game. It has two game modes. So the one versus one game mode, it's highly competitive. Uh, while one player tries to score, the, one, the other one defends. And the defender can e either steal or block the, the ball. And then they, they switch. And the other mode is the race mode. It was developed as an alternative game mode for players who don't like that um, the game to be so competitive. So this is a race. Both players are scoring at the same time. When the time is up, the one who has scored the most is the winner. When we developed the game and when it was designed, uh, we thought that the one versus one mode would be the preferred one. Uh, and actually, um, everyone in the studio uh, preferred that game mode. But once we released, this is what we found. Um, more than 60% of the matches were played in the race mode, and less than 40% are played in the one versus one mode. But we were okay with this result. We just had to accept that users prefer it like that, and we keep developing the game as, as it was. But later on, we developed another game that is similar. Now it's a football uh, game, and it also has the two game modes. So the one versus one is more competitive. One player shoots and the other one defends. And the race mode, which is again timed, players shoot at those targets and the one who scores more points will be the winner. Well, this time we thought that users would prefer the race mode since we have a similar user base and they also prefer the race in Basketball Stars. And we developed the game uh, having that in, into account so that the race mode would be the preferred one and the main core gameplay. But we released the game in soft launch and this is data from soft launch. We saw right away that most players prefer the uh, one versus one game mode and only 15% of the matches were played in the race mode. So developers and the team uh, of this game were really concerned at this point uh, and they were uh, wondering if it was worth to keep the race mode in the game because when they did the global launch, if they had the two game modes, they would have to double up all the work that they do uh, forever, right? So they, they asked the help for our team to see if it was worth to have the race modes in this game. And what we did was a segmentation analysis. So first we also did it for basketball stars. We divided players into several categories based on the matches that they played. So the red category is our players that are just trying out because they haven't played much matches until the point that I did the analysis. Uh, and then we have the green category, which are players with no preference. They play uh, both game modes um, the same amount of times. But these are players with preferences. So we have the one versus one fans and the race fans. We have more fans uh, in the one win the race mode. Uh, but these segments seem balanced, and we were happy with with these um, numbers. But I ran the same analysis for Football Strike. This is soft launch data, so of course there are a lot of people in the red category trying out, some in, with no preference in the green, but these are the one versus one fans and the race fans. And the race fans are almost insignificant in our player base. Uh, so again, they ask me, well, can you check if those fans have any value to the game, because otherwise we would just quit the race mode and develop only the one versus one to global launch. And what we did was to analyze different metrics for this segment of users. Um, here we have the sessions played per user. Um, and what you can see is the, the beginning of the plot is really variable because uh, it's the first days of soft, soft launch. But once this stabilizes, you can see these two blue lines are the race fans. So they actually play more sessions per day than users in the other categories. Also, we saw the average revenue uh, of users by their um, segment category and also by their retention day. And what we can see here 
is that, well, since the beginning, these users that are race fans, they actually spend more money on average per user than the fans of the one versus one modes. And if you see for um, higher retention days, this trend is even higher. So they do spend money in the game. And also, uh, we analyze their return rates. This is the return rate for day 14, and it means that, well, this is the percentage of users who have played 14 days ago and returned today to play the game. And we also see the same trend. Users that are race fans, they do return more uh, than other users, so they return after two weeks more often than the others. So based on these findings, we actually think that those users are valuable. So they do play more sessions per day, they enter the game more often, they do spend money in the game, and they also return. So this led to the decision, sorry, okay, this led to the decision to keep developing the shooting race modes. Um, even if there are just a few users, we believe they are really important for us. And the game is running for more than a year now. We still have uh, less users playing these modes, but uh, they are still very valuable to us, and I guess this was a, a great decision that was, well, based on our work. Now, um, I will pass the presentation to my colleague, Daniela. Hello, uh, I'm Daniela, and I'm also a game analyst at Miniclip. But I work solely with 8-Ball Pool, which is a typical pool game for mobile. And the next uh, examples that I will present will be all from this game. I will start with the topic of monetization, and monetization is the ability to produce revenue excluding the, the purchase of the game itself. In a freemium game like 8-Ball Pool, we monetize through uh, selling items, uh, promotions, and game currency, and we call that in-app purchases, and uh, we also monetize to, through advertising by incentivizing users to see in-game advertising videos. Um, there are two types of currency in 8-Ball Pool. Coins are a soft currency and they are easy acquired through gameplay. Um, users can also get them uh, by uh, purchasing uh, in apps or by watching uh, advertising videos. Uh, they can uh, watch a video and earn a specific amount of coins for, for, for that effort. Um, and we also add another currency which is cash and it's an art currency. This type of currency is very difficult to access in game uh, with gameplay alone. You can only have it by leveling up or um, logging in in a social platform. But you, you can uh, get it at ease uh, with in-app purchases. Up to this point, we had no way of uh, giving cash through advertising, but the advertising team um, wanted, to, wanted to have this, so they proposed that uh, we should award cash for users to see, um, to see video ads. The idea was that if we allow users to, to see videos for, for this uh, type of currency, uh, we would engage much more users because this, because this is um, um, a pretty rare resource in game. So much more users would, would uh, be prone to watch videos to get this uh, than coins uh, itself. However, the product team was not so happy about this decision because they were concerned that if we, if we had more cash available within the economy, uh, it could make cash less valuable and users would not be so prone to purchase, uh, purchase cash through in-apps. So these competing perspectives uh, challenged us to adopt a strategy that would satisfy both sides. Uh, our colleagues at the data science team uh, have developed this algorithm that segments users in real time by their probability of making a purchase or um, churn in their next session. So the uh, Y axis is the probability of purchasing and in the, in the bottom you have the probability of churning. Uh, this, this plot is a visual representation of the algorithm and it shows the percentage of users that fall in each of the segments that were created by this it's called the MOT, or moment of truth. Um, so we, we proposed to, to our product managers that we would segment users based on this algorithm uh, to, for them to see uh, videos or not for cash. 
So the control uh, would have the options that they already had, no videos for cache, and the test would have uh, um, users that uh, were able to see one video for one cache only once a day. And we give this, this option only to users that were in this first red area, the, the bottom line. Um, since they, these users were not uh, prone to convert anyways, because th their probability of making a purchase is so low, uh, we were giving this to them um, as a way to monetize them, so it would be good for the company because we would not monetize them in any other way. Uh, so we think that this might, might work. After the test uh, went out, uh, we see that there is, in fact, a quick, uh, a really small uh, decrease in the, in the um, core monetization of, of the feature, uh, of the game, exactly. Uh, and, but this, this, um, this trend is not significant. These results can be uh, only due to chance. Uh, so, at the same time, uh, the advertising revenue increased uh, significantly after we introduced this, this, um, this feature. So without losing revenue, uh, without having a significant loss from revenue by our, our um, core monetization channel, we were able to increase advertising revenue by giving something to users uh, that we knew was m much valuable to them and that they would not access in any other way. Um, lastly, I want to talk a bit about uh, the virality issue. Virality is the ability to acquire players through the action of existing players. So to allow this, we have to create social features uh, that trigger actions in game, that create social content um, as shares like in, in social platforms like Facebook and Twitter. The most recent social feature in 8 Pool was the introduction of clubs. And this feature uh, allows users to join together in a club of up to 50 members, and they can have unique interactions between them. They can play friendly matches, they can share exclusive gifts between them, and they can talk within their chat uh, about, uh, about whatever, <laughs> uh, with their fellow club members, like within the club. But the biggest incentive that we have for users to be in a club is to accumulate winnings together and to climb up the leaderboards in order to receive these amazing rewards by the end of each week. Um, there are three types of leaderboards in game. The global leaderboards, a leaderboard for each country, and the league leaderboards. The leagues are composed of 25 clubs and they are progressive. Uh, so clubs that perform better each week are promoted to higher leagues and will be winning bigger prizes by the end of next week. However, the clubs that are in the bottom will be demoted to lower leagues and compete for less appealing prizes in the following week. We incentivize users to share their, their achievements and their, the prizes they win on social media each week. But these prizes uh, they win in leaderboards are currency that we inject directly into the economy. So it is important that we balance it. Um, so our task here was to, to, to estimate how much currency would be injected in the game through this uh, feature. To do so, we have to know how many clubs will be in the feature over time. And we have not uh, launched this yet, so we don't know, actually. So to solve this, we had to, to simulate different behaviors that were proposed by our, our design team. They come up with four progression um, design ideas and with some prizes to award in each one of the, of the leagues. And what we did is we simulate any, uh, all of them and we plot them against each other and calculated how much currency was given in each scenario. And this helped them choose uh, what was the best scenario and how much they wanted to give in each, in each, uh, in each stage. Uh, so this allows us to, to ensure that the feature remains appealing to users while not uh, inflating the economy. After the feature went live and over the course of three months, that I have been since, since the release, 
we see that we are uh, awarding less than 0.2% of the value of our daily coins economy and less than 20% of the value of our cash economy through this feature. But at the same time, we have a very good engagement with clubs with uh, over 46% uh, of the users that have the condition to be club members uh, are in fact uh, part of a club. And um, uh, we have uh, more than 650 clubs um, active on a daily basis. So to wrap up, I hope that by this point you understand better of how our team interacts with the remaining teams at Miniclip uh, it, in order to intervene uh, in each of these, of these uh, the steps of the player life cycle, cycle to avoid them to churn. So we showed you how we increased the retention uh, in soccer stars by giving the, uh, the possibility to users to, to award, the, to, to get free coins and to share the game with, with their friends through WhatsApp. Uh, we discussed how we decided to keep a game mode, even though it, uh, it, was, it attracted very few users in Football Strike, um, just because the users that were uh, highly engaged with this game mode were very important users for us. They were highly engaged users and they spent a lot. Uh, we also talked of how we keep, um, we keep up the advertising revenue while not compromising um, the, the purchases of, of our in-apps, our uh, channel, core channel of monetization. And lastly, um, we showed you how we simulated uh, ex expected behaviors for, for club progression in order to, to stabilize economy, but uh, deliver an engaging feature that would create social content uh, and bring more users to the game. Just to, to conclude, I want to thank to uh, Ricardo and Pedro for allowing us to use these drawings, which are very beautiful images available on their blog on games and data. And we would, lock, lo <laughs> would also like to, to, talk, uh, to thank our colleagues at Miniclip, especially the BI team, uh, because all these examples are a collective effort and I bet they all know how they contributed to each one of these in any particular way. Thank you. Hi. Um, you mentioned during your football example that you did some data analysis. Hi, over here. Hello. Uh, you mentioned during the football example that you were doing data analysis and seeing what the market trends were. And it seems to me like you don't seem to do UX testing pre-release. Is that true? Or do you, like, do you yes. just do a data focus? Yes, we don't do user research uh, at Miniclip. Well, we, we, have, uh, <laughs> we have design. I mean, like, <laughs> and we do some the, um, the pre release. So, like, do you do UX pre release as well, or are you exclusively data focused? Sorry, uh, I couldn't hear you. Um, do you do user research before the release of products, or do you solely focus on the um, data analysis post release? Yes, we, we don't do user research before we release a feature. We can do it inside our company, so there are some groups we test the feature together, but only with mini clippers. Uh, and we we base uh, we base uh, we are actually based a lot in data analysis. And after the game is running, we can do kind of user research with this A/B testing, which is live. So we test groups of users live in the game. But before releasing a game, we don't have the user research uh, methodology. Thank you. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Um, just a general question about the use of social platforms for the virality of games. Um, is that, is that going to continue, kind of? Is, do you see the rates going down, or do you, is Facebook still going to be kind of a medium to, to kind of promote users to engage with the games? 
Uh, or is that, do you see that going down over time or is it kind of changing in, in general in the future? If, if we predict that social platforms would not be... Uh, yeah, basically. Or is it still a kind of a, a trend, a stable trend, or do you see it kind of going down or, as over time? No, I don't see it going down. I, I think it's really pretty stable. Uh, well, users uh, share a lot of content in social media. Uh, when they play the game, they have those share buttons and they share that they won. And also, um, they have leaderboards. And one of the leaderboards is just for friends. So you can see how your friends are doing, and that keeps users playing a lot and playing more because they, they want to win more by the end of the, the week. I guess, I guess social platforms work very, very well, and I don't see that going down. Cool. Thank you. Um, hello, um, thank you for the talk. I really like your data approach, um, and I think it's really interesting how you are extracting meaning from the data. Um, but my question is, um, I think it's like all your conclusions are really dependent on what metrics you select to extract, right? So my question is, what do you decide to extract from the data? Like, you, what kind of telemetry? Um, because you could extract like how long players play, right? What kind of game modes they play? Uh, how long per game mode? Um, so yeah, like in your team and what are the decisions you make to choose the metrics and if you can like summarize like some really useful metrics you found, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, to choose the metrics, uh, we really, what we do is that we talk with game designers to see what they expect of the feature first. And then we try to push them to have the answer for what do you really want to have with this? What is your goal? Because it's very uh, important to understand your goal, to have a clear metric. If you don't have a, a clear goal, um, a, a clear metric that, okay, this is, uh, I want to increase retention with this. Uh, when the results come out, it's a mess. Everyone is like, oh, but this is bad for this and good for that, and maybe we shouldn't do it because of X and Y. So our approach is to choose the metrics of interest before we run the test. And, for us, it helped a lot, our, our, our work. Um, I'm not sure whether you're allowed um, I'm not sure whether you're allowed to share um, this information, but I was interested to know um, what kind of percentage of your audience you are able to monetize in some way, and whether that's grown. I guess you've had improvements based on some of the things you talked about. Um, of getting them to watch adverts and that side of things, but how, how, where was that to start with and how has that shifted in a vague figures, if you can? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that analysis. I'm not sure how many players convert through video ads. Uh, uh, do you have any idea? Well, we are not the analysts for <laughs> advertising, <just Yeah. laughs> for starts, <laughs> sorry. That's why we don't know. But. Well, we have few users monetizing through in-app purchases, but I guess with video as we, we have a lot, like the majority, the majority yeah. of users. So using that uh, model that we talked about, the moment of truth, um, I believe we, we can monetize like almost everyone. But your in-app in purchases on their own are quite a low percentage, is that what you're saying? In the percentage, yeah. yes, they are it's, low. It's a low yes. percentage. Hello, I'm Laden from Nordius. Uh, thank you for a great talk. So, data around the football strike was pretty interesting. Uh, about how many players play free kicks mode and how many players play shooting race. Did you, many, did you maybe go into why's, like why there is a s so big percentage of players playing uh, free kicks and solo for shooting race? Yes, we, we have some uh, hypotheses for that. Uh, the, game, the game modes are really similar to basket, but they are not the same. Uh, so in basketball, the more competitive one, I call it one versus one, just to simplify, that one, the other player can steal your ball and block it. But when you're playing football strike, in that same mode, they cannot do that. Well, they can defend, but they're far away from you. It's, it's, 
doesn't have any interaction with the other player with you. So maybe they prefer that one over the basketball one because of that. And also uh, the shooting race in football strike that is not so uh, preferred. We believe it's because you can steal the target from the other player. If you play at the same time and your ball hits first, uh, then the other player would have shoot as well, but lost the, the target. We, we changed that a little bit, but not that much. Yeah, I played the game and that frustrates me as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any more for any more? Yeah. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, hello, I'm a, a player researcher, but I'm really interested in data analysis because I'm a data believer. Uh, I'm kind of new in this field, but could you explain a bit more about the difference between retention and engagement? Uh, because for me it's yes, kind of similar, yes. like, yeah, you know. Uh, so, retention, when we analyze retention, what we look at is uh, if you were acquired today, uh, all the users who are acquired today, what is the percentage of users that will log into the game tomorrow and the day after and the day after. So that's like day zero is when you were acquired and then day one is your second day after acquired, day three is the third day, is the fourth day after you were acquired. So it just means that you have opened the app, you logged in. But when we talk about engagement, it means that you do actions like playing matches and you change currency, so you spend coins in the game and you do uh, purchases with virtual currency. So you are engaged and you open the app and you do play the game. And that's the, the main difference. Thank you so much.